Okay, can we uh, proceed? Do we have all the attendees? Not quite yet. Still waiting for council member here. Okay, there she is. One moment. Hi, everybody. Hey there. Welcome. All right, let's get started. Um, so it's my pleasure to call to order the regular meeting of the Tiburon Town Council uh, on November 2nd, five o'clock. Um, Lee, can you please take a roll call? Yes, Councilmember Fredericks. Here. Councilmember Griffin is absent, Councilmember Thier. Here. Vice Mayor Ryan. Here. And Mayor Walner. Here. Okay, uh, so our first item of business is oral communications. This is the part of the meeting where we ask members of the public if they'd like to comment on something that is not on the agenda. Uh, Lee, can you provide instructions? Yes, thank you. If you would like to make a comment during this meeting, please use the raise hand feature of Zoom, which will indicate to me you would like to make a comment. You can find the raise hand button on your webinar controls bar on the bottom of your Zoom window or smartphone screen. If you're using Zoom, I will invite you to turn your camera and microphone on to address the council. Please accept the request from the Zoom host that you're being promoted to a panelist. If you're calling and using a phone, you can dial star nine to raise your hand, or you can submit an email to comments at townoftiburon.org. Great. All right. So with that, I see we have at least two comments. Why don't we go ahead uh, and start with Ruby M. Hello. Hi, Ruby. We can hear you. Thank you. Um, just give me one second here. I've prepared my comment, so I'm just going to read it out because it was late mail. Uh, I'd like to request clarification on how the town of Tiburon applies its zoning ordinance when calculating heights of structures. Section 16-30.050 of the Tiburon Municipal Code states that height is calculated from natural grade and defines natural grade in subdivision as the grade on the approved subdivision grading plan. When you take a look at 16-30.050, the height limits and exceptions, section C says height measurement, height is the plumb vertical distance measured using a plane established by the lower of the natural or finished grade at the perimeter of the exposed exterior surface of a building structure fence or wall, no point of the roof edge fence wall, parapet mansard structure or other building feature shall extend above the plane established by the maximum height line from grade except as specifically excluded below refer to 3.2 on lots and subdivisions where there is an approved grading plan that has been implemented and accepted as complete by the town, the elevation is established by the subdivision grading. The, uh, the, the elevation established by the subdivision grading shall be considered the natural ground elevation. I posed this question in a public comment time of the June 9th, 2021 planning commission meeting. Um, when we were discussing the um, the one that was discussing the ADU ordinance and you know the ADU construction standards, and the answer from the director of community development was that height was calculated from existing grade, and that staff does not go back to the subdivision grading plan to establish natural grade. Uh, I think um, some of the planning commissioners also commented uh, on this, and I was pretty surprised because. It contradicted what was read, you know, what I, I could see um, on the Tiburon ordinance. Ms. Tassini said um, uh, when staff measures uh, it from existing grade, they, they don't go back to the historic nature of it, partially because even though someone is allowed 50 cubic yards per year, those get graded and moved around. So when someone comes in, they have a survey and the staff looks at what the existing grade is 
and they don't look what the historical grade is when the lot was first created. Um, the, the, the Director of Community Development is ignoring the Tiburon Municipal Code, which clearly defines natural grade. I went into the town offices and I also asked another staff member and the town engineer, and I recorded that meeting as well. And they let me know that um, it, you know, the ordinance was wrong <laughs> and uh, to follow up with Dina Tassini. I think that it's really important that you clarify this information because people could just throw that existing 50 cubic yards onto a drainage area that affect, affects other uh, owners and the subdivision as a whole. So if you could please clarify and get to the bottom of why the public is being misled on the language in the ordinance. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Ruby. Um, next comment is from David Mahler. Unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Sorry, I, I was having some trouble uh, unmuting there. Uh, well, good evening, Mayor Wellner, uh, council members and staff. Uh, my name is David Mahler. I live in Larkspur, and I'm calling tonight on behalf of the Marin Sonoma Building Electrification Squad, several members of which live in Tiburon. At your uh, last council meeting, you heard a first reading to adopt the California 2022 Building Code updates. Uh, with adoption scheduled for either tonight or the next meeting. And the staff report on this item also addressed the three model reach codes proposed by the county to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that are driving climate change. These three reach codes address all electric for new construction, enhanced EV charger requirements, and a point system for more energy efficient renovations. The staff report stated that these three reach code provisions would be considered by the town council in early 2023, and that this would provide ample time for the council to gather community input on this important matter. That was a quote. Well, we'd like to encourage Tiburon to go ahead and schedule a public hearing soon to discuss the three reach codes and to gather that community input, input with the goal of adopting all three in early 2023. We'd like to advise you that several other marine jurisdictions are moving ahead to adopt these three reach codes now and in early 2023. Marin County unanimously approved a first reading of all three reach codes at its October 18th meeting and plans to adopt all three at its November 17th meeting. Several other jurisdictions have already adopted or are planning to adopt the all electric for new and EV charger codes that, uh, and that some are considering the renovation reach code as well. These jurisdictions include Fairfax, San Anselmo, San Rafael, Sausalito, Mill Valley, and just last night, Corte Madera. We'd like to note that implementation of the all electric for new buildings and EV charger reach codes aren't controversial and won't require additional staff time compared to the 2022 California Building Code update requirements that Tiburon is already in the process of adopting. Additionally, the Marin County Sustainability Team will be preparing collateral materials to assist jurisdictions with implementation of all three reach codes. In conclusion, we urge Tiburon to move ahead, join the other jurisdictions that are doing this with discussion and adoption of all three reach codes, and especially the all electric for new construction and enhanced EV charger reach codes. Doing so is consistent with Tiburon's climate action plan just passed and will help Tiburon meet its greenhouse gas reduction goals. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, David, that's very helpful. Um, it looks like Ruby is signed up for another, uh, turn at the mic. I'm not sure if that's intentional or if there's someone else, uh, at that location who wants to speak. Do we know, Lee? I am not able to, unfortunately, see the login information. I only see the name, although I did see two Rubies in this list earlier. So I suspect it might be somebody else. Okay, let's 
Let's try it out and see what it is. Is this a different person than the first Ruby? Yes, I'm sorry. This is Ruby's husband, Mark. I signed in. To, uh, that's great. No, no, no problem at all. That's what okay. we, that's Probably what I suspected. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right, so I have a, a separate comment. Um, my wife and I are the owners of 35 Breedland Woods. On March 31st, 2022, we sent a letter uh, to the town attorney uh, asking some questions about um, our lot, uh, easement questions, maintenance questions, and land use that affected us in relation to uh, town easements um, and other neighbors in our vicinity. On April 22nd, the town attorney wrote an email back saying he received a letter, he would provide our comments, he would provide his comments within a week. Um, on May 18th, I received an email from an attorney at Burke Williams in Sorensen stating uh, Ben Stock, the town attorney, asked me to review the attached correspondence from, from his office and respond to you, um, to your questions, um, which was good. On June 29th, I left a voicemail for Mary Wagner and I got no response. <laughs> On August 1st, Mary Wagner replied to an email that she was traveling in an area with spotty internet and said she'd be back the following week. The following week, I did not hear back from her. On August 12th, I sent another email, no response. August 17th, I spoke to her by phone. She said she'd have an answer at the end of the upcoming weekend. Uh, all through September, no response. And then finally, last week, I got an email from Mrs. Wagner saying, uh, I know you've been patiently waiting. I apologize, and we're working on this, and we will have a response to you. She's correct that we have been waiting patiently, but this raises a few questions that I wanted to pose. Is it reasonable for citizens to have to wait seven months um, and get no substantive to reply to uh, an email like this? I guess our, our, it makes me wonder if all citizens are being treated this way. Are elements of structural racism, equity, or equal access to resources that play here because uh, I'm in a mixed race family? Are issues of delay tactics and targeting in play because my family's been critical of the town in other areas, such as the equal treatment by police, and challenging the changes the town recently made to ordinances, which would have increased the amount of density and affordable housing. Is the town attorney and the town staff using this delay to benefit some other citizens? For example, just today, work has started on another lot in my subdivision that is related to the questions that I asked in this letter. Is this delay tactic by the town meant to frustrate a citizen in hopes that the issue will just go away? We can prepare the same timeline for another issue, a code compliance case that we were told to submit by, to the town by Greg Chanis. And it's been over two years since we've heard on that. In closing, I ask that you please instruct the town attorney to fast track some substantive response. And I'm happy to work with him if he needs clarifications or outside counsel to get this done. And two, I ask that you understand how this delay lands on citizens, especially people of color who live in Tiburon and improve the processes at Tiburon to ensure citizens are treated fairly and equally. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for bringing that to our attention. And um, we can't address it at this meeting because it's not on the agenda, but uh, I'm sure all council members would like to request that staff uh, reach out uh, as soon as possible to get these issues resolved that appear to have been pending for a long time. Um, thank you. Um, Council Member Thier, did you have your hand up earlier for public comment? I'm sorry, we can't hear you. No, I did not. Oh, okay. Not. Thank you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> sorry to put you on the spot. I thought, I thought you had your hand up. It's okay. Uh, it was a okay. pushed button. Sorry. <laughs> all right. So, uh, I believe that's all the public comment. Um, and if there's no one else, then we'll close that um, oral communication period and move on to the consent calendar. Um, is there any uh, council member who wishes to take an item off of the consent calendar for discussion? Okay, seeing none, I'll ask the public if there's any member of the public who would like to take an item off the consent calendar for discussion. Okay, seeing none, uh, I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent calendar. So moved. Second. Thank you. Lee, can you please take a roll call vote? 
Councilmember Fredericks. Yes. Councilmember Griffin is absent. Councilmember Thier. Yes. Vice Mayor Ryan. Yes. Mayor Walner. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so next we move into action items. Um, the first one uh, uh, is the Parks Master Plan. Uh, this is the results of our request uh, to have um, a consultant hired to assist in the development of a master plan. Um, Greg, can we have a staff report, please? Yes, Mr. Mayor, if you give me a second, I will share my screen and let me, uh, too many from the beginning, share, 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 perfect. Now, hopefully you're seeing uh, the first slide of a slideshow. We are. Perfect, great, thank you. Good evening, Mayor, uh, members of the council. Uh, we're going to give a very brief uh, report on action item one, which is the parks master plan. Um, hang on one sec. Okay. Great. Um, the action tonight uh, that we're going to be asking council to take would be to uh, review the draft request for proposal, which is included uh, in the staff report and receive any public comment and consider approving the document and authorizing staff to release the request for a proposal. A little bit of background, uh, as the mayor mentioned on August 17, 2022, um, council directed staff to develop a draft request for proposal for a parks master plan um, and bring that back to council for future consideration. Uh, subsequent to that meeting, uh, staff produced a draft. Draft was reviewed by the entire post commission um, as well as following up the post meeting um, post, two post subcommittee members, uh, Commissioner Nick Farr and Commissioner McInerney, um, provided uh, edits to the document, which were incorporated into the draft that you're seeing uh, today. Um, the proposed draft is a fairly typical, typical RFP, including all the normal information you'd see in terms of submittal requirements and timelines and, and the such. Um, and it should give firms all the necessary information to provide a robust and complete proposal. Um, it's important to note that the, the most important part of the, the draft RFP is the scope of work. And it, as you read it, you should see that we are envisioning a very robust community engagement effort and are asking uh, all the proposers to give us a detailed plan on how that work would get done. In terms of a schedule, uh, this is the schedule we included in the draft RFP, which is you know it, essentially we'd probably put it out on the street tomorrow if it was approved. Um, we're going to offer an optional site uh, a sort of tour, uh, meet pre pre bid meeting is what we would call it in the construction side. Um, then we would have a, a couple of weeks where folks could ask questions, and we'd answer those questions. Finally, with it, and have an RFP due date of December eighth. Um, we're we're hopeful we can get the due date before the uh, holiday break. Um, that way, we can sort of plan how we're going to do the selection process early in the new year. That is really all I have to share. Uh, again, we're gonna be asking you to, to review the proposal, uh, receive any public comment and consider approving the document authorizing staff to release the RFP. I do understand that there um, uh, perhaps are post commission members um, here this evening who would also like to say a few words. Yeah. Council member Fredericks, do you so have a question? Yeah, I, I, I do. Um, and I'm sorry, I took these notes a while back. Um, there was some statement about um, no impact, no environmental impact. That really was of the RFP, right? Not of uh, what the, the master plan, right? Correct. Not of the master plan. Correct. All right. Um, I noticed that, the, that, and it's consistent with some of the language in our previous general plans that were limited to parks. But the relative uses that are available to parks and to open space always comes up. And in fact, even in uh, the documents we were asked to review, they talk about the increased acquisition of open space somehow having an impact on parks. I was hoping that the um, consultant could clarify uh, what is a park, what is available for built environment versus what is the land acquired by either open space resolutions, ballot initiatives, parcel taxes, 
uh, that have constrained use. It'd be nice to have a clear statement of that because we get a lot of emails about things like widen Tiburon Boulevard at Trestle Glen, uh, <laughs> spilling over uh, to that area that may or may not be um, Blackie's pasture. And um, another thing that would be good to see is what the demographics are, if any, um, that drive any new or intensive uh, uses of, of our parks and open space. Um, and also if they can embed it in an, a sense of the history of the town instead of waking up anew and starting from scratch. Things change, but they change in a context. So I think it is uh, very useful to have a context. What am I thinking of? Just simply the residents value of open space and how much money they have been willing to put toward it uh, to acquire it. And that is it. Those are my comments. Okay. Are there any uh, additional questions for staff? Um, I did have one uh, okay. comment. Um, I think on page eight of the RFP, you meant to put November 18th, 2022 for the site visit. It says October 18th. Oh, yep. I, thank you. I think it's November 15th, actually. And I uh, thank you for pointing that out, uh, Council Member Thier. We'll make that correction okay. before. I, there, are, there are a couple of other little typos I noticed that I'll correct before it goes out. Uh, but thank you for pointing that. Too. And um, did Post, so Post had reviewed the RP and did, were their comments accepted or? Um, or... Yeah, so the, the process we went through was the staff developed the draft first. We, we took the, the first draft to the whole post commission at a public meeting, and they made generally positive comments about the, the um, draft. Subsequent to the post meeting, we worked with uh, the subcommittee of post, Commissioners McInerney and Nick Farr, um, where they provided you know, a, a numerous edits, mostly, mostly, you know, minor typographical edits, but there, there were some, you know, um, topics put in there that weren't, and all of those have been incorporated into the document that you're seeing today. Okay, great. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we, all right. So, uh, Greg, you mentioned that there were, uh, some commission members who wanted to speak. I, I thought they would be on. Um, Lee, I want to confirm that both Commissioner McInerney and Commissioner Nick Farr reserved panel, were received panelist links. Yes, they did. I um, also don't see either of them there. Either of them okay. here. Um, I just reached out to them. To okay. Well, we can we can open the public comment period, and if they join, they can certainly present then. All right, so why don't we proceed to the public comment period? Uh, are there any, oh, I see a commissioner. <laughs> uh, yes, sorry about that. I'm please, here. please go ahead. I'm sorry, do you have, are you can, can you hear us? Is my microphone muted or can you hear me okay? We can hear you now. Okay. Great. Um, where, where, where are we right now? So we just uh, heard a staff presentation explaining that this is the RFP that the council requested and uh, we're about to go into the public comment period. Uh, but understand that there are some comments that you'd like to make briefly before we do that. Yeah, I think I think just uh, um, you know we we had planned on on just dialing in and and being a part of the 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 group presenting this to town council so that uh, commissioners weren't restricted to the uh, public comment portion um, of the of this item, and so that uh, so we could answer any questions that town council might have uh, on the RFP. And I'll I'll sort of end it there, and we can go to public comment. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, public comment now. Um, are there any members of the public who would like to comment on this agenda item? Okay, seeing none, uh, we can close the public comment period and bring it back to the 
council for comments. Are there any comments on this other than uh, in addition to the ones that hopefully were carefully noted by staff that council member Fredericks made initially? And I apologize for that. <laughs> There's no need to apologize. They were well taken. Uh, council member Thier, it looks like you have a, a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I'm very excited about this. Um, I know that the parks uh, master plan has been a very um, big priority for the Parks Open Space and Trails Commission. Um, I think it's an excellent idea for us uh, all to plan out the vision and I uh, believe the consultant will help uh, and I am just excited. This is a long time coming and I think it's going to really also help the council evaluate projects that come in and we'll have kind of a, a hopefully a framework or a map or something like that in which we can truly evaluate the projects against something other than um, whether we like them or not. So uh, I just wanted to say that and I wanted to thank our post commissioners uh, Isaac Nickfar and Angela McInerney who I believe are the subcommittee uh, and also thanking staff for making this uh, happen. It's exciting. Okay. Other comments? Actually, I have a question. Please proceed. Go ahead. Um, Angela McInerney just did an incredible job of gathering the information about the available trails and access uh, to parks and to our open space. Will this somehow be incorporated in the larger document of um, of the either the general plan or the uh, document, the recreation plan that we're generating now. I th I think the short answer to that is yes. I, I right. don't I can't tell you today how exactly that will look or or where it'll be, but I, uh, I for sure that's important information and one of the goals. One of the things we expect uh, the successful consultant to do would be to do a very deep dive into the historic. You know all the historic work that's been done um, by the town in this area, and and that would include any work done by post commissioners, and any information we can provide them is going to benefit uh, the process. Yeah, and 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 uh, and just to sort of give some some additional background, we've done a few a few things. One of them was was what uh, what Angela put together, which was really great. Um, I think for the for the RFP itself. Um, uh, I think this would come at a, at a later step, right? Is is actually scoping and 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 adding in, you know, the parks, trails, and lanes, and that sort of thing would be a a, a step post RFP. Okay. Any other comments from the council? I just want to say I um, uh, I'm delighted that we'll hopefully begin the process here of having. Um, a plan and some criteria for evaluating projects. And I'm especially gratified to see in the RFP uh, that there's a strong emphasis on trying to identify what residents are thinking. Because uh, I think uh, as Vice Mayor Ryan has pointed out uh, in the past, it's that's a really challenging step. And even if we have meetings where, you know, 100 people show up, that's still, uh, you know, it's it's, we need to use lots of different strategies to suss out what the what our community wants to do with this with these treasured areas of our of our community. So, uh, is there a vote that you need, um, or is this just a, a presentation uh, of the RFP that you're going to issue? No, we've structured this as an action item. So, um, you, you know, you asked us to come back, you know, for this to review. So we, we structured it as an action item to approve okay. the RFP and, and authorize the release of it, basically. All right. So do I have a motion for that? And just would the motion include um, this, any suggested items to cover that are not already in the RFP? I don't think we need to amend the RFP to include the information that okay. um, that that's come up. We I, what we would plan to do is it, we did take notes and you know we would share that information with all the the firms um, and particularly with the successful firm. You know we would have as I think uh, Commissioner Nick Farr mentioned. You know after the RFP after we select a we will work with that successful contractor to develop a scope of work that meets all the needs, right. which may not. Have been particular, you know, perfectly articulated in the RFP. So there's a lot of opportunity to make sure we get everything we want. Okay, Holly, hit it. Uh, so moved. <laughs> Is there a I'll second? Second. Second. Sure. I'll second it. 
We have a second and a third. So we're, <laughs> we have a, a wealth of approval. Uh, Lee, can you take a roll call, please? Councilmember Fredericks. Yes. Councilmember Griffin is absent. Councilmember Thier. Yes. Vice Mayor Ryan. Yes. And Mayor Walner. Yes. Great. All right. Uh, next, we have municipal code amendments. Uh, can I have a staff report, please? Uh, not municipal code amendments, uh, proposed budget amendments, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, I think it may have been. Yeah, I've jumped ahead to the second public hearing item. What I meant to say is budget amendments. Please okay, perfect. Okay, um, again, can I just confirm you can see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Um, Going to be a very brief presentation. Um, let's see if I can get it to advance. What we're asking council uh, to do this evening is consider authorizing budget amendments. Well, two, two different budget amendments. One would be to cover um, the cost of, of four projects that were funded in the prior fiscal year, fiscal year 22, but for a variety of reasons, uh, either weren't completed or in, in, in some cases didn't even start uh, until the very end of the year or even in fiscal year 23. Um, so what we're asking you to do is essentially to reallocate that money in fiscal year 23. Um, that's item one, and that totals $141,858. The second item is to authorize a separate budget amendment in the amount of $60,000 in this fiscal year to cover the cost of remodeling a town one of the town-owned condominiums at uh, Point Tiburon Marsh condominium complex that became vacant after the budget process had completed. Um, and we didn't anticipate having to do a renovation until the, the unit became vacant. I'm gonna provide just a little bit of detail on both of these and then be able to answer any questions. This is the table that's directly from the staff report. This shows the four projects um, that are related to that first uh, action. Um, two, two were initially budgeted in the police department and the other two were in public works. Um, the first item is the license plate reader system, which you folks all approved last year via a budget amendment. And due to supply chain issues and changing a little bit the, the, the technology we're gonna use um, has delayed this unfortunately um, until this year. So there was no money expended last year. And um, the good news is due to the technological changes we were able to um, research and hopefully in, and implement, the cost of the project has gone down significantly. Um, so when you had approved a $60,000 500 budget amendment in last year's budget, which we spent zero, we are now projecting that the total cost of the project will only be $35,000. So we're asking you to do the budget amendment um, for this item, $35,000. The second uh, item was a organizational assessment that started in fiscal year 22, um, but again, uh, due to some issues in get, getting data from the records management system, we haven't been able to complete this work. We're hoping we're gonna complete it here by December. Um, $10,920 was expended in the prior fiscal year. The original allocation was 30. We're asking you to reallocate $19,080. Public Works, you may recall, there was a pedestrian safety project that was funded 100% by a grant from the Transportation Authority of Marin. This, we called it the Del Mar Neighborhood Crossing Improvements Project. Again, this project crossed fiscal years. We extended to, we expended 292,208 in fiscal year 22, and we need to reallocate $62,000 to get to the total project cost of 354,208. The final item um, that was again uh, approved in last year's budget was $25,000 to install a generator transfer switch at the building um, on Ned's Way, that where the ranch is. This would allow us to use a trailer mounted generator in the case of a power failure or wanting to use that facility for a public safety power shutoff or, or for community um, gathering center during a disaster. Uh, the, again, the work wasn't completed uh, or even started in FY22. Um, so we're asking to reallocate that money. And this year, the project has gone up a little bit in cost from 25,000 to a fixed cost of 25,778. So those are the four projects that were previously approved in the prior fiscal year. The second item, uh, which is related to the Point Tiburon Marsh condominiums, again, is a unit that became vacant after the FY23 budget process was complete. 
we're, we're essentially doing a complete uh, redo of the, of the unit, complete kitchen and bath replacement, all new flooring, electrical and lighting upgrades, and then, then the entire unit will be painted inside. Project cost is $60,000. The source of funds uh, for this amendment would be the town owned housing reserve fund. Um, and I should have mentioned, I'm gonna go back one slide. On the right hand column that highlighted in gray, each one of those amounts shows you the source of funds. And so, for instance, the first item, when you approved the budget amendment for the license plate reader system, you indicated that the money was to come from general fund operating reserves. So we're, we're and they're all the same source of funds that you originally allocated the money from last year. So. Again, these are the two action items um, that we're asking uh, council to consider and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I also have, I believe Patrick Kerslake and David Issue available um, if I get stumped. Okay, any questions for staff? Yeah, I did have a question. Um, so on the on the transfer switch for the recreation building, that just seems like a lot for a transfer switch. Um, almost twenty six thousand dollars. Do you know uh, if um, like estimates like there were a couple estimates received or? I don't. Um, again, as Patrick Patrick is the one that's probably most familiar with this in individual project. Um, I mean, I can tell you that it's a you know fairly sophisticated switch, meaning it's a you know it's an yeah. electronic sort of digital transfer switch, mm -hmm. um, and they are you know they're significant, they're they're expensive. So, Patrick, are you? <laughs> um, you sound like a cartoon character. Yeah, your voice is very strange. Yeah, Patrick. it actually sounds like auto tune. Auto tune. <laughs> Oh, still not working, Patrick. No, it's not working. Oh. Sorry, Patrick. It's not not happening for you. Well, let me let me interject here. Uh, the amount that you're asking for is not. I'm asking this as a question, even though I'm saying it as a statement. It's not necessarily the amount that you're going to pay. This is the amount you want us to authorize. And then are you going to put this out for bid or something like that? No, this work has already been, we've already, you know, we've already have a vendor. Again, this was, this was, this was authorized in last year's budget. Um, and, you know, we, the project got going late and we already have a vendor and, and authorized the work. And the, and the number 25778 is the number like that will be the amount of the, the, the work and we because we can't reach patrick we don't know the background of how that number was derived at is that correct i i know it's a quote from a vendor and it's a vendor we use uh you know fairly frequently dc electric so okay do you have any follow-up council member Thier, or um i just yeah i mean if you can call in maybe that then he can just respond i'm sure there's a there's a reason but but it is twenty six thousand dollars. That's that's a lot for. Seems like a lot, but um, is Patrick able to phone I'm not in? Not sure. I mean, while while Patrick's trying, um, I, I'll just simply say, you know, it's a fairly complicated or you know, it's a fairly involved job, right? Because they're installing a a, a new a brand new electronic switch on the outside of a building, and then they have to tie that all in to the service entrance panel. Um, you know, in the event that we end up using a generator, you know, everything has to be tied into the existing electrical system. So it's a significant amount of electrical work. Um, it's not just a box on a wall bolting it on. Um, there's a, there's a quite a, quite involved wiring that goes on uh, to get these switches in. So. Okay. Uh, let's, we will, um, Lee, let us know if you are able to connect somehow with Patrick while we're Proceeding, are there any other questions for staff? Um, I have one on the, um, with respect to the um, the budget amendment for this coming year for the renovations. I mean, I, I'm glad we have that, um, the housing reserve fund, the repair of reserve fund, but on the expense side, like do we project a regular outlay, even though we don't necessarily anticipate when people are going to vacate the apartments, we got to anticipate that there's some maintenance or is it just the case that we always just go 
the budget amendment route because they're sporadic? The the vacancies are very sporadic. So for the any renovation that's significant, we you know we normally if we know in advance, we'll have it in the budget process. But when it happens after the budget's approved, we, we're sort of forced to go to the budget amendment route. We do budget every year um, a, a set amount for maintenance of each unit we own. And I think it's $2,500. And then we sort of randomly pick one unit and say, you know, this one may, we may, may require more work this year. So I think we put one at 10,000 and all the others at 2,500 uh, in the operating budget. Um, and that's to cover mostly minor maintenance issues that come up during the year. So. Okay, thanks. Okay, any further questions for staff? All right, we'll close that and move to public comment. Are there, is there any member of the public who uh, wishes to comment on this agenda item? Okay, seeing none, I see a phone number. I'm wondering if that may be Patrick trying to call in, but. Yes, Mayor Wellner, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Good evening, everyone. Sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to chime in about the ranch transfer switch, and we did get uh, two prices on that project from two different companies. One was the electrician uh, that we use for most work um, within the town, and the other was a firm that does the regular maintenance uh, and repairs on our generators. And the firm that does the maintenance or the uh, regularly performs maintenance on our generators. The, it was, I believe, at least twice the amount that uh, DC Electric had quoted us. So we went with the most economical option of a manual transfer switch for the ranch facility um, okay. to fit within the budget that we had uh, requested for the prior fiscal year for construction. Okay, thank you, Patrick. I, I knew you probably did that. So I just, uh, it helps to hear it. So thank you very much. I don't have any further okay. questions yet. Okay, so uh, we've closed the public comment period uh, and answered questions. So are there any uh, additional comments from council? All right, seeing none, um, looking for a motion to approve uh, the budget amendment. So moved. I'll second. Thank you, Lee. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Fredericks. Yes. Councilmember Griffin is absent. Councilmember Fear. You're we muted. can't. Did you hear my yes? I said yes. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Vice Mayor Ryan. Yes. And Mayor Walner. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So now we're moving to the public hearing. Uh, we have two public hearings. Uh, the first one is the appeal of the design review board approval uh, at 8 Auburn Court. Um, can we have a staff report, please? Yes, we do. Um, <clears throat> I believe that Sam is going to be sharing for me as I speak. And um, can you pull that up for me, please? Thank you. So what we have before us tonight, council um, and mayor, mayor and council members, um, is an appeal of a site plan and architectural review for a property located at 8 Auburn Court. Next slide. So in the outline here, you see the location of 8 Auburn Court. It is um, about an 8,300 square foot lot in the R1 zone. Um, it's currently improved with a single family dwelling. The request at the time was for exterior improvements that included expansion of the front entryway and the existing and an existing second story deck facing the rear yard. In addition to that, it was um, in addition to the existing roof, they wanted to increase the height from 19 feet foot five to 22 one inch. Next slide, please. So this will give you some chronology. We have been working on this project for some time. Originally, the property owner came in um, and the first um, application was to create this massing um, that we couldn't support with the chimney extension because of the blocking of view from the neighbor across the street. The applicant withdrew that application and came back with a new minor alteration. And um, we referred that um, to the DRB. 
And the first meeting for the DRB was scheduled on June 16th, 2022, then was continued at a request of the, of the applicant um, to June 30th, 2022. And at this meeting, um, the DRB proposed uh, a few design changes to mitigate potential view impacts for the neighboring properties. Um, so then the applicant came back with revised plans on July 21st, 2022, um, where there were additional design comments. After these two um, hearings, another set of revised plans was submitted for review on September 1st, 2022. And these plans were approved with conditions with respect to roof height. And um, you'll see those in the next slides as to what we're referring to. So just so you can understand, this is the existing condition. This is what the house looks like today. As you can see, there is a, a large chimney um, there both and the existing west elevation is that that, that faces the street. Next slide, please. And this was the original, the first uh, project that came to us and um, the chimney was just too large and would create a great blockage um, for the neighbor across the street. Next slide, please. Um, on June 30th, this was what was presented to um, the DRB. Um, and um, as you can see, there is, a there is a, um, an increase in the height, um, but um, the chimney still remains. So that appeared to be another issue for um, the design review board and for the applicant across, for the property owner across the street. Next slide, please. So with that, the design review board felt that a hipped roof would at least provide some view corridor from some areas within the house uh, across the street, as well as a reduction in the chimney to more of a flue. So you can see in the west elevation, there's the hip, and then we show you in a bubbled format on the north elevation, you can see that better in the side profile of the flue. Next slide, please. So the revised design for the application that was approved um, on, on September 1st is what you're seeing today. So there's an even smaller flue. Um, so you can see the outline of the chimney in red and dotted line reduced to the flue as well as the hip roof that um, is now included as the proposed design. Next slide, please. So this is the original that you'll see. And then, so you have the larger chimney and you have the, you have the larger chimney and you have um, a non-hip roof and you have a small flue and a hip roof. Next slide, please. And just to show you a little bit more from the original and the proposed from the North Elevation. Next slide. So what are the basis of appeal, which is what is before you tonight to consider is that the applicant is the, the appellant and the applicant finds that the modifications to their existing roof that was proposed in the architectural plans and submitted for review comply and are well within the principles and the goals established in the Hillside Design Guidelines. Staff response is, is the following, that um, goal three, principle 7A of the Hillside Design Guidelines states the view protection is more important from the primary living areas of the dwelling unit, for instance, living room, dining room, et cetera, then for less actively used areas of the dwelling, bedroom, bathroom, study, den. And as you can see, the diagram below shows you that there's no obstruction for the bridge when looking at, um, if there's obstruction of the bridge for looking at it from a living room, then we have an issue. If it isn't and it's from bathroom, then we don't. Uh, next slide. And so what we found is that um, the view from the driveway at 11 Auburn Court which is the neighbor across the way on the cul-de-sac facing eight Auburn. Um, and if, as you see right now in the red is the recent story pole configuration. There is some obstruction, but it's taken from below at the driveway. Next slide, please. Um, and so we do want to look at blockage of important objects and how do we accept blockage of other less well-known um, landmarks. It's something that we look at when we're looking at structures and so does the design review board and that is what this diagram shows here. Next slide, please. So 
we looked at um, the story polls and the proposed configuration um, and the original story polls. So the top um, figure that you're seeing was the original story poll configuration in 2021 that staff said it's too high and you have the chimney, there's too much blockage. Then in the conditional approved or the one that was approved now, you're looking at the story poll at the lower one. And as you can see, there's more of a water view. There still are some bridge and city views that are not obstructed. And I know it's hard to visualize, but um, the chimney is now a flue um, and there's a hip roof. So from a bedroom and from the main living areas, the obstruction is not um, as great as if uh, the chimney remained. Next slide, please. And so um, principle 7E of the Hillside Design Guidelines um, does state about a wide panoramic view and how we can accept a, a view, can accept more view blockage than smaller slot view. So we looked at this as a panoramic view. Um, and so as you can see from the previous slide, the panoram panorama is still there with the water view um, being slightly obstructed, but not to any, um, none of the landmarks are obstructed as a result of the roof. Next slide, please. Um, the second uh, basis for the appeal was the applicant made multiple modifications to their proposed design, but the condition imposed by the design review board to lower the pitch even further prevents the applicant from installing the shingle roof desired, which was among the many primary objectives of their project. And I believe you received some late mail as well from neighboring properties with that um, concern about the materials used on the roof as well. Next slide, please. So our response was, since the application was filed in 2021, the applicant has modified the project design multiple times, re reducing the scope of the improvements to address the neighbor's concern. The maximum roof height has been reduced twice and a portion of the roof above the ground, garage, excuse me, was revised with a hip design to minimize massing. The chimney was also removed and the existing skylights were removed, reducing not only the visual impacts, but also mitigating any new lighting that could be seen from the uphill neighbors. And that further reductions would appear to diminish, diminish the original intent to improve the home. Next slide, please. And with that, I conclude um, and within, within my time limit as well, I might add. Um, and if you have any questions of staff, I'd be happy to do so. And I also have um, Sam Bonifacio, our assistant planner who did a majority of the work on this project. Okay, so um, thank you for that presentation. Um, does anyone, uh, any member of the council have follow-up questions uh, for Dina? Council Member Fredericks. Um, yeah, and I don't know if you can answer this, but I guess um, one of the issues is uh, the impacts and the feasibility of, and I'm just using these words without knowing what they mean, the 2.1 roof versus the 3.1 roof. Mm -hmm. uh, the conditions of approval from the DRB approved the 2.1 roof, okay. Really, what is the difference in terms of height from the existing roof of a 2.1 and a 3.1 at the highest point? I believe that there are architects online as well, so he might be able to answer, but I believe it's about a foot. Um, but part of what happened with this change for the applicants, and they've, they've come to us with that, is that this type of application with this type of, the application for the composite or the shingle roof, uh, the asphalt roof is not as feasible with once you get to this two to one slope and that um, contractors are saying to them, you know, we can't guarantee this work. We can't, we can't do it this way. We can't provide the insulation that you've reduced the height to such a, I don't have enough room to work around this. I'm saying it in the simplest forms possible. I'm sure that Mr. Holscher or Ms. King could help me on this when they're looking at it. But that was the, what I had heard was that we have provided them with a condition now that might make it difficult to apply the product as, as they wished. And so our, our source of information about the use of the product that is desired is the architect and the applicant. We have no 
independent information from contractors? No, we generally don't do that, um, right. but we don't have that now. So the reason I'm asking is I just wondered why the DRB disagreed with that. It's a room full of architects. I, I can't answer that question. They, they didn't discuss, I watched one of the meetings and I didn't get it either. Okay, thank you. Okay, other questions? Um, Vice Mayor. Thanks. So in that presentation, um, Dana, was, was there, were any of the photos that we saw taken from the primary living space of 11 Auburn or were they all taken from street or driveway level? The one that showed you the panoramic view of the water was taken higher up from the primary areas. The one that you saw of the garage with the um, kind of the outline of the story poles was taken from the street and the driveway across the street. We then went up further and took the second set, which was to show you the panoramic. And what I kind of um, alluded to was that the, pan the panorama wasn't really affected to, you could, the waterway was obstructed a little bit, but you could still see the landmarks that you could see before. Understood, but I, I mean, the primary living view, the primary living space is even higher than their highest driveway. That is correct. Right? That is correct. So, were the photos from the driveway or from their primary? They were area? from, um, I believe that, could you answer that, Sam? Because I believe they were taken yeah. from above. They were, yeah, they were taken from the exterior of the home. I wasn't able to, when I went to take photos, um, get inside the property. So it was just as high as I could get on the outside without disturbing anyone. So they're not within the property, pardon me, residence. Which sets a little higher. Um, Vice Mayor. Okay. I, I also had a question if you're done, Jack. Um, I think it, as an applicant, you're going to have an opportunity to to present in a minute, I think. If that's okay. Um, John? Yes, yes Council Member um, Thier. So I, I did have a question on the actual appeal. Um, I guess I'm used to more of the appeal. Um, on the form versus a letter and i just want to make sure that the the actual appeal is just um the difference in height of the roof pitch is that correct so my understanding it is for the roof pitch of the you know that they with the front entry etc i do not believe the applicant had any problem with that it was the roof height Right. Reduction in the in the height. Okay, so it was just that second reduction in the height. That's correct. And do you know where who took the photos that are in this actual appeal? Because these are saying, I mean, saying view from living room. It looks like it's inside. I believe that um, the applicant, uh, the appellant, excuse me, is going to speak. So maybe she can address okay. the the photos themselves. We took it from. As um, Ms. Bonifacio said, we took it from the up as far as we could get high on the on the property. Right. I can see the ones that that I believe um, Ms. Bonifacio took, but inside the appeal, though, these other photographs that look like they might be from inside of the house, and I just don't know if they are or aren't. And and Ms. King is going to be speaking Perfect. next, so I'm sure that she can. Uh, she might even include them in her presentation. I haven't seen that yet, okay. so I think she's included them. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. I knew I had seen those and I just couldn't figure out where. And I, <laughs> next. We're hiding them from you, Vice Mayor. It was Exhibit 8. Exhibit okay. eight. Uh, I know, I see them. Thanks. Okay. Other questions before we get to the applicants or the appellate, the applicant and the appellant's presentation? Okay. So um, let's go ahead to the uh, appellant's presentation and I wanted to ask um, our director of community development are there is there are there any rebuttal presentations or is it just the uh, applicant appellant I actually don't believe I re I have not received any that would have gone through the the town clerk 
but I do not know of that, but I believe that the um, neighbor may be present in the um Okay, and then I'll have an opportunity to speak. Okay. That's correct. All right, so why don't we go ahead with the applicant uh, and appellant presentation. Please proceed, Laura. Thank you. So good evening, everybody. Um, thank you to Mayor Wilner and the council members for your time this evening. I'm sure you're very busy, so we will try to um, make this um, short and sweet and keep within the 10 minutes. Um, that we have allotted. I'm Laura King. I'm the homeowner of a, a Auburn Court along with my husband. Um, we're here today to discuss the appeal of the Design Review Board's resolution um, on September 1st of 2022. Um, in particular, I'd also like to give a shout out to Vice Mayor Ryan and Council Member Fredericks for visiting our home yesterday. Really appreciate that time. It was rainy and I do appreciate you coming out to see for yourselves what the situation is. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. So as background, um, and, and thank you again, um, Dina, for that great presentation. I think that gave a lot of good background. I also am going through the background, so forgive me for any duplication. Um, I didn't know you were going to be as thorough as you were. So um, our proposal was we wanted to replace what is a current flat tile and gravel roof with a three and a half by 12 pitched shingle roof. Um, that is with an objective of improving both the insulation, which is not up to code, and to improve the curbside aesthetic. When we left the last design review board, their resolution was to limit the pitch to a two by 12. So lower than we had asked, um, and they recommended it be finished with shingles or a cap sheet, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, I did wanna speak just to, um, I think it was council member um, Frederick's question, that the difference between the three by 512 that we asked for and the two by 512 that was included in the resolution is 10 inches of height. Um, the one thing I did wanna note as we go through this presentation is that um, we have called different contractors, the architect has called different contractors. Um, it is clear that the standard for shingled roof is the four and a half by 12. We were able to find contractors willing to guarantee the work at three and a half by 12, which is why that was our recommendation. We have spoken to um, five different roofing contractors in Marin County. The ones you see listed here, we believe are the most prominent in our county. They have all said they would not do a shingled roof on a two by 12. Okay, so what I wanna focus on is the cap solution that is what is remaining to us as an option. Next page. So it's twofold in our rationale for this appeal. The first is um, that given the visibility of the roof of our home from street level, which I'll show you in a minute, we believe that the cap sheeting would be not only an aesthetic downgrade for us in our home, but also for the neighborhood in general. And the second thing is that when we did the original proposal of the three by five by the, the three and a half by 12 pitch, um, we actually reviewed the guidelines and we felt very comfortable that we were well within those guidelines. And I'll walk you through our rationale as well with the photos that were alluded to earlier. Next slide. Okay, this is a picture of our current home. Our home sits below street level, so you have to walk down 10 steps to get to our front door. This is a photo taken from our front gate. As you can see, the roof is a primary visual um, when you open our gate from the street level, um, and it needs replacing. It's leaking. There is mold and mildew growing on the tar and gravel. The insulation, as I mentioned, is not up to code, and we have chronic issues with gravel rolling into and blocking our gutters. Next slide. Um, just as a in case this comes up, we're not looking to do a flat roof replacement, but flat roof replacements are really limited to two options. Tar and gravel is no longer recommended because it's labor intensive. It has the mold and mildew growth we talked about. It's got the gravel issues, et cetera. Um, the options really available today are a foam roof, which nobody is recommending, but I wanted to put that visual up there to say that that is option number one. Um, number two is a recommendation coming out of the design review board and it's called cap sheet roofing. It is essentially, um, if you imagine a shingle that is four foot wide and rolled into sheets, um, that is a cap roof and they lay it down 
um, either with a torch or with a um, hot melt um, and sealant. So that is um, just to give you all a visual in case you're not familiar with it. Next slide. Um, so to be fair in this appeal, you know, we wanted to, we really wanted to be fair. So I actually made a bunch of phone calls and said, I've only to contractors that do roofing and said, I have not been able to find any attractive cap images online. Can you send me pictures of what an attractive cap roof looks like? Because I don't want to get into this meeting tonight and be challenged to say, yes, here is an attractive example. Um, and not only... <laughs> Could they not show me any, but they actually said the following. Um, so Larry Hadley, which I'm sure you're familiar with Hadley Construction, said to me, I have not seen a good looking cap roof. Um, there is a right place for it, but it's not on custom homes, in my opinion. And he went on to say that the difficulty in do doing cap on um, residential homes is that residential roofs have vents, they have skylights, and these are sheets. So there's a lot of customization. And he said, um, he does not feel, and I quote, that contractors in this area are well versed in applying cap to residential homes. Um, I also spoke to Sarah Lopez, who is the owner of McLaren Roofing, another very large roofing company in our area. She said simply, camp is not attractive. It's not meant to be aesthetically pleasing. It's meant to waterproof the interior. And that's it. Um, I also spoke to, and I, I didn't catch her name, which is why you see a blank, but the, um, the a assistant at Able Roofing um, who said, I don't have any photos. Um, and that was my, to my question of, of, do you have attractive cap samples? She said, I wouldn't say cap is the most beautiful roof. They all kind of look the same. Next page. Um, we also spoke to our neighbors that are on either side of us. Um, so on one side, we have uh, Don and Jeff Egbert. On the other side, we have Jeff Chen and Ramon Partita. Um, spoke to both of them about um, the proposed roof with the shingles and the resolution from the design review board for the cap. Um, they have both written letters. Um, I think they should have been received by now. A, the quote from Donna in that letter to the town council says, I've spoken with the Kings. I've seen the photos of the cap style roof and we feel it would be rather unsightly. A shingled roof would be much more attractive and in keeping with the other Auburn court roofs. Um, Jen Chen um, has sent a letter and I have not seen that yet. Next slide. So this is our, our proposed remodel, which you've seen. Um, it has a hipped roof. Um, we have removed the unsightly um, chimney entirely um, to make it whatever we can do that is the minimal of required by code. Um, I would also say that um, we feel that we have um, worked really, really hard to, to work with our neighbors to get um, address their concerns. A, and I'm running out of time, so I'll skip to the next page. Um, we also feel in the second piece of this discussion is that we feel like we are well within the Hillside Design Guidelines, um, which state, as Dana said, the view protection is more important for the primary living areas of a dwelling than for the less actively used area of a dwelling. And you saw that same slide. So um, somebody asked about the photos. Um, when we first um, decided to do this project, I actually asked the neighbors at 11 Auburn Court if I could visit their home because I did not want to <laughs> obstruct their views. And what I did was I took a picture from their living room and this is the expansive view you see as their primary view from the upper level, which is where the primary living area is. Next slide. This next picture is a picture taken within the home from the guest room on the lower level. Um, as you can see, the chimney does obstruct their view. Uh, we've said that would go away, but as you can see on um, the guide, the story poles are not there, but they would be minimally um, obstructive. In fact, we believe the net result would be an enhancement of their view. Um, I would just say on this one, you see on the left, the island of Belvedere, you see the spires of the Golden Gate Bridge. Those primary viewpoints would not be obstructed. It would be a slight bit across just the lower 
or level of water. Next page. So in conclusion, we believe that our proposal of the three by five by 12 shingled roof um, is well within the hillside design guidelines for view protections. And we also believe that the cap sheet solution that was proposed by the design review board would significantly reduce the curb appeal of our home and diminish the aesthetic appeal of our neighborhood. And that leaves me with five seconds. Thank you so much for your time. said, wow, expertly done. That was uh, <laughs> perfect timing. Uh, thank you for that. Are there any questions for the uh, applicant appellant before we move on to other public comments? Okay. Thank you. Um, I know you'll be standing by in case other questions uh, pop up. So thank you for that. Let's open it up to public comment. Um, I see we have uh, one person. Um, not sure if I want to dare to pronounce the name, uh, but Trig, is that is that correct? You're you're up. There we go. Are you able to hear me now? I am. Okay. Excellent attempt at the name. I know it's difficult. It's missing a vowel. Trigva. <laughs> oh, it is. Okay. Trigva. Yep. Like it's spelled. And, uh, okay. Th thank you for uh, allowing me some time to speak. I'll, I'll be pretty quick. Uh, sure. I think first I'd like to say that ultimately we, we actually agree that uh, a shingled roof would be a better looking roof than what is currently on the property at AL report. Um, there's been several iterations of uh, the design and changes that have been made, and eventually it was brought down to the three uh, and 12, uh, three and a half and 12, which helped to lower it. Uh, some concerns that we have are that adding, um, you know, what, you know, solar eventually on it and um, some flutes, you know, vents and things like that will stick up beyond what that three and a half and 12 ultimately is going to be at and the impact is um, is greater than just having the roof at at that height. Um, I, I did go ahead and make some phone calls because I didn't want to push for something that was undoable and I spoke with a company called North Bay Roofing and Gutter and I asked them specifically if they install 2 and 12 um, asphalt tiles and or shingles and they do. Uh, they, they have done it. They've done many of them in Marin. Um, they said that uh, they would want to come out and inspect it first to see if the uh, slope was correct. And I told them it was a flat roof that was being rebuilt and built up to 2 and 12. And they said, yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. So um, Nor North Bay Roofing and Gutter has confirmed that they have done the installation um, of uh, asphalt tile on a 2 and 12. So perhaps that could be somebody to reach out to. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that's not noteworthy is that um, while this is improving the look of the roof at the neighbor's home, the greatest impact is to us because we're staring at that roof uh, regularly directly from our property. And so we'll be the ones that are looking at it more than, than anyone else. And doing anything possible to minimize that impact uh, is what we're hoping for. Uh, a 2 and 12 minimizes that impact. Um, removing the chimney minimizes the impact. And I think with a 2 and 12 and no chimney, it's, it's actually a win for us. And we're very supportive of that. And, uh, you know, we, we, we hope to see that that is the result um, of this meeting. Uh, you know, we agree with the design review board that that is a, a win on both sides. Thank you very much for, for listening to me. Thank you. Um, okay, are there other public comments? I actually wanted to see if I could ask him a question. Sure. Um, could we get uh, Trig back? Trigva. Um, okay, he's on, he's on. Sorry, I didn't realize he was on. Um, could you, could you comment on the photos 
because I actually want to make sure that I'm looking at the photos that are directly from your house versus not from your house. I don't want to put you on the spot. So I don't know if you have the documents up. Uh, if you do, could you comment on uh, the photos in uh, Exhibit 8? think you're allowed yeah to we we see that your uh your hand is up and that your mute is off uh i'm not sure why we can't hear you lee do you know what's going on i'm seeing the same thing you are so i will try to promote him back in again oh because he's an attendee that's why yes i moved him back okay okay can you hear me Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Sorry, I guess I jumped out. I thought that my time was up, so I, I, I left off. Um, yeah, so the the photos, the photos that were in the presentation from the neighbors was uh, that picture is taken from the balcony, the furthest point out on uh, of the home. And the one that was in the presentation from the town, uh, if I understand correctly, that was taken from the front door area and there where there's a bedroom uh, at that level so that's the lower bedroom um and then i didn't there are no other photos i don't believe that were presented okay okay thank you so much absolutely okay um other questions okay i see no further questions um so why don't we then proceed to comments what are people thinking mayor if i may yeah. uh the applicant appellant is entitled to up to a three minute rebuttal Thank you. Um, just to clarify, I think the question um, that a Tor had, council uh, person Tor had, was about the the photos that were included in the appeal. Those were all taken from inside the home. Um, the The comment that I would have is that um, we have not spoken to anybody who would be willing to guarantee their work. Um, so the question that I would have a of the proposed roofing solution was guarantees of work, which is obviously the most important thing for us. Um, a, and I don't know if our architect David Holscher is on the line, but he also had spoken to different contractors and he might want to comment in our three minutes that we have available. I don't know if he's still there. You said David Holcher? David Holcher, yes. Yeah, he is. There he is. There he there is. He is. I think you're on mute, David. There you go. Now you're on mute. There we go. Um, if the very first thing we did was contract you know we it's a kind of sound strange but a complicated project we're putting trusses over the existing roof so we can keep the inside wood so really not change the interior and we went to the three or four contractors in which i work with and not a single one would guarantee it two and 12 and not a single one so we we went to the minimum that we could possibly do like we were saying before 4.5 and 12 is a common comp shingle roof and we're going very minimum we have to put a sheet underneath for it to work so we truly are at the industry minimum for the roof and that's as far that's as far as we could push it okay thank you laura you have another minute if you're done that's great if you have further comments please go ahead 
I don't have any further comments. Thank you. Um, the only other comment I would make is that the difference, um, I would just reiterate what I said at the very beginning, that the difference in what our desired roof height is to get the shingles that we believe from everything that we've heard would be the guaranteed ones um, is a difference of 10 inches. So we're not talking about a big differential, um, but obviously it's it's a big impact if you can't have a the workmanship on your roof guaranteed. That's it. Okay, thank you. So um, now back to the council, um, who'd like to start? I, I can start. No one else is starting. I'm um, sorry, everyone. Oh, no, go ahead, Jack. So, and I'll be maybe not helpful because what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate my comments into two parts. Um, <laughs> one and, pro and one con. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> and, and sometimes I do that because it is a two part problem, but maybe I'm separating it needlessly. But so, so I got to say, like, on its own, I feel like that the merit of this appeal is really strong. And and I I don't see any reason to deny it. And I almost certainly would vote to approve it. The second part of that comment is, you know, if the two neighbors want to get together and be in the uphill, uh, if, if Trigger and his family can find contractors that will do the work and guarantee it, it would be a shame to preclude that outcome if the neighbors want to work it together. So, um, like again, if we're just talking about the appeal, you know, it, I, I absolutely agree with the applicant slash applicant that it's that the views they're taking are just not protected by the hillside design guidelines. And so, on that basis, uh, you know, I would approve the appeal on the merits. Again, it would be nice to be able to approve it and then still leave open the possibility of further negotiation between those two without us being involved. Um, so. Why don't I leave it there and we'll see what happens from there. See if someone else can fix my. Oh, I can say something. Who wants to go next? Sure. Okay, Council Member Fredericks. Um, so I, I think that Council, Vice Mayor Jack Ryan's um, uh, chicken solution is great. It leaves us a little because this is, this is really difficult. I visited both homes. I saw the views from the neighborhood, the neighbor's living room. Yes, it's 10 inches, but it really does take out the foreground of the water view. It's not a monument, but water views are part of the view. And it's really not that panoramic because it's sort of enclosed um, by, by some trees. And I don't want to minimize it. Um, it, it, is, it is still a view and monuments are a priority. Um, you know, whether the foreground water view from the main living area is a reasonable compromise to give the appellant what they want um, aesthetically, it might be, but I'm concerned about something we have no control over. And um, so I'm gonna jump on uh, the vice mayor's wagon of if only the parties could work it out. Um, the second real concern is that any future uh, solar panels, which local jurisdictions have very little authority to condition, will set up another increment attrition of that water view. If there was only some way that the neighbors could get together and come to actually a written agreement that the solar panels will, as it says in the packet, be put on the other side of the gable roof, um, you know, I would be more inclined um, to, to feel that the, I forget what it's called, 3.1, the, the higher roof, the 10 inch higher roof um, was a good solution. And then there are unknowns, you know, whether a mineral cap roof looks like shingles on a low, on a pitched roof. Um, we had some pictures in the packet. I actually went online and looked some things out. Um, it, they can look much better than what, what is in the packet. I have to admit, and I'm not an aesthetic authority, that they don't look as good as, as shingles. I would think the 2.1 pitch roof can be installed um, if there is a possibility of getting standard warranties. And because there are these unknowns about the solar panels and uh, what we were presented as the aesthetics of the cap roof and um, how much the blue, the water view blockage um, the attrition from that if there are solar panels. 
I'm just inclined to support the DRB's conditional approval based on their experience and their expertise. So I'll I'll go next. Um, so this is this is this is a tough one. Um, I do believe, uh, though, that we should be supporting the design review board. Um, they heard this multiple times. Uh, they came to what I think is a reasonable solution based on the hillside design guidelines. Uh, I do believe taking that amount of a water view would violate the hillside design guidelines. I also think that, um, you know, the, you know, whether, whether I agree with council member Fredericks that, um, we don't really have the information about whether someone could do, um, you know, the roof at two and 12 versus three and a half and 12, uh, because that is not information that you know was just gathered from from uh we we don't have that information before us also what i don't think we really have before us is um all all of the photographs and from what i've seen um it would take that 10 inches would take a significant amount of the water uh, view which i think is very important uh, I too share the concern uh, with solar. Um, uh, you're not allowed to actually uh, regulate that as a local municipality. There's very little regulation and the placement of the panels depends mostly on the sun and the pattern of the sun. So even if it's something we could regulate, I don't know that we would be able to because we would have to, you know, it may make it so that the panels aren't as effective for the homeowner. Um, so I'm actually inclined um, because the DRB has heard this so many times and had an opportunity to work with uh, both parties to try to come up with a solution. Uh, I will respect um, what the DRB did. Okay. Can I just add one thing? Just please. Yeah. I think as I visited both homes and a, a court from the primary living views, the 10 inch addition does not block the water views. It only blocks the water views from the driveway level and the lower bedroom. Yep. So it, it, it doesn't, I, I, I was there, I was there too, Alice, we can disagree, but. And, and Alice doesn't agree. <laughs> yeah. I, I must've stood in it in different places in the living room. Yeah. And I, I actually wanted to, uh, both homeowners know that I contacted them and I, I would have been there except I couldn't because of my back, which is out, which is why you see me going on and off camera this evening. Um, but I want to thank you all for sending me photos and uh, what you did send helped me to visualize it. So thank you. So let me clarify what I understand people have said. So I know that Council Member Thier said that she would deny the appeal. And it sounds like Vice Mayor Ryan said that he would approve the appeal. And I'm not entirely sure. Council Member Fredericks, did you say you would approve or, or deny? I, I would support the DRB's uh, decision. So you would deny, okay. Would deny. Okay. Uh, I have one, I have a question, um, either for staff or the applicant. Uh, I just wanted to understand if the, I know that you've uh, surveyed um, roofing companies to determine that uh, a number of them would not guarantee uh, the work at the uh, two foot level. Um, is, was that information that was presented to the DRB or is that information since the DRB decision? That, excuse me, that information is since the decision. Oh. Because the DRB <clears throat> made the condition and then i believe that um the applicant or slash appellant and um architect um were concerned because they could not find contractors to do that kind of work and to guarantee it so maybe um sam has additional information uh, yeah so the information bro that was in the presentation tonight is from the actual responses more recently but in the initial application that was 
one of the points that the applicant originally made is that in order to install, have the proper insulation and guarantee the work that it could be done at a lower pitch, but that in order for the work to be guaranteed, that's why they were proposing the higher pitch. But the actual responses from local contractors, that was new. So they were aware of that when they made the decision, but the responses from the contractors were new as of this presentation. Okay. So Can I get a clarification of that. So mm -hmm. the information is not from the staff about the contractors. It, it's from um, the appellant. Is that right? Yeah. The responses that they provided. Thank you. From the contractors. Yes, we, yeah, we, did not, we did not as staff poll contractors. Right. So my, um, in general, my strong inclination is to, especially given how much work has gone into this, is to uh, uh, support the work of the DRB and deny the appeal. However, I feel like there's data here that's been gathered that the DRB has not seen. And if the DRB were presented with information from four contractors saying that their proposal was not uh, practical to the extent that it could be guaranteed by a roofer, uh, it might change their view. Uh, so I don't, I don't know. First of all, I, I don't know what the council thinks, but I also don't know what the applicant thinks uh, about going back to the DRB. Uh, but it seems to me like, you know, this is one of these situations where the DRB made what sounds like a reasonable decision. There is new data that maybe if they became aware of, they would make a different decision. Um, rather than intervening on the basis of the new data at the council level, maybe we should represent that to the DRB. So uh, I don't know if the applicant is available. Is that is that something you think might be useful? I see Laura in the list of attendees, but I don't. There we go. Hi, this is Laura. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Because I, I don't see <clears throat> my face. Um, yes, we'd be happy to do that. And that is correct that it was, um, we had understood from the work that Holscher did that the minimum, the, that the accepted standard was four by 12 when that was not um, going to fly, he, he called around at that point and said, he's found somebody that'll do three by three and a half, by, um, but that we had never even spoken about two until that was what the design review board recommended. That was what triggered the calls and the, the comments that um, no, they wouldn't. They wouldn't touch that kind of slope. It was too low. Okay, so given that my proposal to the council, thank you, Laura. Given that my proposal to the council is, especially since the applicant is amenable to it, um, I suggest that we send this back to Design Review Board with the opportunity for the appellant to make this information available to them and see if they change their view. Uh, if they don't, and they give some reasons for it that we can then understand and respond to, that would make them more comfortable in affirming their decision. Um, and if they do find some other approach based on this new data, I think that could be beneficial. So that's my suggestion. Uh, do other folks have thoughts about that? No, I would make that a motion. Okay. Is there, is there a second? Second. Okay. Lee, can you, unless if are further comments, Lee, can you take the role? Councilmember Fredericks? Yes. Councilmember Griffin is absent. Councilmember Thier? Yes. Vice Mayor Ryan? Yes. And Mayor Walner? Yes. Okay, so back to the DRB it goes. Thank you, uh, and thank you for your thoughtful presentations, um, all of you. Um, <clears throat> all right, so next we have municipal code amendments that I jumped to earlier. Sorry about that. Um, it says continued to November 16th. And those are continued to November 16th. So we don't have those tonight. No. Um, are there any town council reports? Is there a town manager report? 
No, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, then uh, we are adjourned. Thanks very much, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night.